so you mentioned rule of law. Uh, this is something we kind of talked about on on our shows, talking about the two Michaels. The, the idea that you know, in democracies, we have uh, rule of law. In China, they have rule by law, where you know laws essentially serve political purposes. It seemed like the Chinese Communist Party had a really hard time understanding that in Canada, in America, there's the rule of law. You can't just release somebody because it's diplomatically convenient. Do you think there was like, because of those fundamental differences in how law worked, do you think there was just like heads butting up against each other with that? It's an interesting, really interesting point you've, you've honed in on there. And um, the Chinese understand our legal system as well as we do, if not better. And as we outline in the book, a former attorney general, uh, justice minister of Canada went to China to try to help, you know, get these guys out. And, uh, and the Chinese government came back and said, well, listen, you know, your law, your extradition, you know, law and has um, the ability of uh, political ministers to exercise their discretion. As, you know, Section 23.3, the Chinese said, why don't you use that and just, you know, have your minister walk into a courtroom and use their legal authority and put an end to this. And it was it's, it was kind of presented to us by Alan Rock, and you know, it's, in, it's in the book. It's sort of one of these law and order moments where the lawyer on one side of the table realizes, oh yeah, they got us. They uh, they found our mm. on our legal Achilles heel there. We, we we knew that one might be coming, and boy, they sure did their homework. Um, mm. So there was that was an element of it. But then there's as I'm sure Fen can describe, there's a whole overlay of politics on top of that, and how it's how these things get executed, and you know. How, how, you, how you move forward from, from something like that. Executed may be a poor choice of words when we're talking about how China executes law. Uh, well, so, Finn, what do you think about that? Well, I think, you know, the Chinese are as capable as anybody else of, uh, you know, reading our extradition laws and, you know, seeing if there's an opportunity for a political intervention, uh, which there is. And in fact, there was quite an active debate in the country as these two guys were kind of languishing in jail, uh, you know, by uh, some people, including uh, former Justice Minister Alan Rock, saying, you know, particularly given, uh, you know, COVID, these guys are really at risk as, you know, uh, in, in jail. Um, you know, we should just, you know, bring this whole thing to an end and, you um, uh, you know, the justice minister should uh, exercise his authority to say, you know, this this case has become too political uh, and we're going to end it. We're going to put her on a plane, uh, send her home, and uh, the Chinese uh, uh, will uh, return these two guys who are, you know, innocent captives. Others felt, and uh, obviously including our prime minister, that, um, uh, you know, there was... Uh, uh, a legal uh, uh, process underway in the extradition hearings that were taking place before a, um, uh, a, a British, uh, uh, sorry, British Columbian uh, uh, justice of the British Columbia Supreme Court. Uh, and, um, you know, the government wasn't going to interfere in that process. It was going to let it run its course. And, uh, and um, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, it, it, it almost did until uh, uh, a deferred prosecution agreement uh, uh, was uh, concluded uh, uh, in, in the United States that allowed uh, Meng to go free. But with, with that sort of, you know, getting into the legalities of it, I think there was a strong sense in Canada that, um, um, <clears throat> you know, the government wasn't going to intervene for, um, you know, Political reasons. Um, the government had come under criticism, actually, in a in a, a case involving one of our major companies that had been looking for a deferred prosecution agreement, and that had kind of blown up uh, in uh, uh, on the political stage. And so, um, you know, there was no way that uh, the government of Justin Trudeau was going to touch this one with a barge pole, to be honest. Uh, and I think there was also a recognition that that if they did intervene and do what some were arguing, that the um, Trump administration, which, um, you know, there have been very difficult uh, negotiations for the new NAFTA taking place, 
Uh, we had uh, aluminum and steel uh, tariffs uh, that the U.S. had put on uh, Canadian uh, producers. It's a you know major industry in Canada that um, you know this wouldn't l- be looked on very kindly by Washington. So uh, you know they they were kind of between a rock and a hard place, and I think the sense was you know we have no reason to intervene here. We're going to let uh, uh, the rule of law run its course, and um, you know if. If Meng and her lawyers in uh, Vancouver don't like the outcome, they can appeal it and it can go all the way to the Supreme Court. And this thing could have gone on for years. Meanwhile, the two Michaels would have, you know, sat sat in jail in in China, uh, uh, subject to the vagaries of the Chinese legal system. The thing is, there was a political calculation there, too. So. Well, so it's interesting that you mentioned that, like, at the time, public opinion in Canada had turned against China, whereas before it seemed like there was a, a desire to, you know, strengthen the Canadian-China relationship. Right. There was public, I mean, in terms of public opinion, you're absolutely right. I mean, it didn't, it, you know, it's been tracked and it has kind of uh, it's turned negative. Um, but public opinion was also divided in Canada about what to do about these, about the situation. There were a lot of people, I don't know the polls in front of me, but there, I mean, there was, this, I mean, it was it was fairly divided. There were there were, there were many very reasons. divided. Yeah, about 50 fifty more or less. Because you know a lot of Canadians were looking at the human rights situation in China. They were looking at what was going on in Hong Kong. They were looking at you know the threats that the Chinese were uh, you know levying against Taiwan, um, the Uyghur situation, and so you know there was a real you know, ambivalence, um, you know, some saying, well, we got to deal with China as it is, we got to trade with it. And others saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, we shouldn't, right? Um, we, we can't sell our principles and our values. Uh, uh, when it not comes even, to- and, and even beyond that, we can't, we, let's not break our own rules. We've created these rules, we've created the system, we're going to play by these rules and, uh, and see where it goes. It's pretty tough on the, you know, on the two Michaels and their families. It was it was brutal. It was, and they, you know, they, you know, they pushed hard um, and tried to basically push the line that uh, let's find a legal, moral pathway to negotiate an end to this. And they they pushed that hard for a long time, and eventually it uh, it, it worked. It, it developed that way, and it was basically because I think the, you know the, the new Biden government, new Biden administration, decided that it was in its interest to push this, to play this. I mean, one of the things that's kind of interesting is you can kind of see this as a play, uh, you know, a narrative where, you know, it's our rule of law versus the Chinese rule of law, and it's a standoff. One of the people we interviewed was uh, General Spaulding, who worked in the White House until Trump fired him. You know, his his view, which uh, is kind of interesting, is that Meng and the two Michaels is, is really the first hostage, major hostage crisis of the new Cold War between China and the United States. And, you know, it's not a battle about the rule of law. I mean, as he said, and we quote him in the book, he said, we don't respect the Chinese rule of law and they don't respect our rule of law. And so this was a classic at the end of the day, you know, it should have been seen, um, you know, as kind of a classic hostage exchange, you know, kind of like Gary Powers after the U2 incident. Uh, you probably remember that uh, from the history books. You know, he was the, the the guy who flew that U2 plane that went into Russian space and was shot down and he wasn't killed. Uh, uh, he was arrested by the Soviet, uh, Soviet authorities and, um, you know, eventually traded um, for uh, some, Amer- uh, for some uh, you know, Russian spies. And and in some ways, I mean, that's kind of how it played out. I mean, it played out as a hostage exchange. Um, and so, you know, in some ways, in many ways, I think, um, you know, Spalding kind of nailed it. And, uh, and, you know, what he also said was, you know, if you're going to deal with the new China, you know, there are probably going to be more of these in the future, just as there were during the Cold War, right? Lots of hostage exchanges. Um, and, you know, the battle isn't uh, over saying our rule of law stands versus your rule of law. Um, you know, it's uh, it's fighting 
the Chinese on, you know, the space of, uh, you know, on the playing field of cybersecurity, you know, keeping them out of the North American market, uh, and new technology, new 5G uh, cellular technology. I mean, you know, he said that's where the game is. I mean, you know, this this stuff is, he, did, he didn't exactly say it's nonsense, but, you know, you have an obligation to bring these people back and, uh, and uh, you know, you trade Meng for that. 